Terrific. So um, <clears throat> once again, thanks for joining me. Uh, we're going to be talking about resurfacing and the state of the resurfacing um, <clears throat> in 2020. Uh, basically, it's uh, why I continue to resurface, um, and I think a lot of you are familiar with the concept, but um, if you're not familiar with the concept and you go to other surgeons, uh, there aren't that many surgeons uh, performing resurfacing. Uh, I want to thank Debbie McCrate uh, for running Hip Resurfacing Site, providing lots of patients with information, a uh, really wonderful resource. Um, also helping me arrange the online conference and getting a great showing for tonight. <clears throat> so just by way of background, in case you're not familiar with me and I haven't met you before, um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon specializing in hip and knee surgery since 2003. Um, I practice at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, uh, which is the oldest orthopedic institution in the world. Uh, that's the picture there. It's right on the Upper East Side. Uh, beautiful, beautiful location, usually when we're not having a crisis. Uh, so great place to visit and people do all the time, come in for surgery, stay for a few days and then uh, go home. Um, I began performing resurfacing in 2004. Uh, so I was fortunate to be involved with some of the clinical trials uh, before um, it was really available widely. And then um, as the implants became available, um, started to do that more and more. Um, I started with the Conserve Plus implant, which is pictured here on the top. Uh, then I was part of the Biomet recap trials for the FDA. Um, and then the Birmingham hip resurfacing was available from Smith and Nephew in 2006. And uh, I continue to be an investigator in the FDA trials to ensure the safety of these devices, especially the Birmingham and hip resurfacing is now approximately 60% of my surgical volume. I still do hip replacements, hip resurfacing, revisions, knee replacements, partial knees, and so forth. But really, um, <clears throat> as you'll be able to tell, uh, my passion is hip resurfacing. Um, I was fortunate to train with Dr. Amstutz here. Uh, he's an HSS alumni, so he actually came to HSS, gave a lecture on resurfacing. Uh, I was fascinated by it when I was a resident, so I spent some extra time um, to visit him and learn from him. Um, as I became familiar with the concept, um, I realized there's just so much more experience worldwide. So I went to visit, uh, this is Kuhn Desmet, uh, Derek McMinn, uh, Tom Gross here in the United States. So a lot of people uh, who... Um, have, I think, contributed to my learning and also my surgical technique. So I've tried to really incorporate the best of what I've learned um, through that. <clears throat> so total hip replacement uh, is a wonderful treatment for hip arthritis. So um, if uh, it ends up that you're not a candidate for resurfacing, but you have really bad hip arthritis, or you're in an area where the hip, hip replacement is going to be your best option, uh, the good news is that it is a fantastic, fantastic procedure. So here's uh, an endorsement from The Lancet, the operation of the century. Uh, it has been looked at many, many times as probably one of the greatest innovations that um, <clears throat> medicine has come up with to improve quality of life. And, and that's the hip replacement shown here. So why would we resurface a hip when we have the operation of the century? So I'm gonna go through some of the reasons why I believe in resurfacing. Well, as good as a hip replacement is, I do think there are some limitations. Uh, first of all, there is bone loss. So you have to remove the top of the femur, cut the bone at the femoral neck, then you have to basically hollow it out a little bit and uh, put a titanium implant into the medullary canal. So it is definitely taking more bone than uh, it might be necessary. So here's an x-ray of a hip replacement. On the other hand, if you never need the hip replaced again, it probably doesn't make a difference. Uh, another limitation of a hip replacement is longevity. So this is a patient uh, who had her hip replaced before the age of 40. So she's quite young when she had it. And she developed uh, what's called osteolysis, which is a process that occurs because of wear of the parts. So uh, the older parts would wear out. They were made out of plastic. Uh, 
And what would happen is that the plastic debris around the hip would cause bone resorption. So these kind of dark spots that look like Swiss cheese um, basically are the bone getting reabsorbed because of that process called osteolysis. So longevity was a problem. Uh, it's much better now with current materials, but it could still be a problem for young patients. And I would say for, for sure, especially for active patients, stability of the joint can be a problem. So uh, this is a picture of um, <clears throat> a hip replacement that has dislocated. So the, there's no connection between the ball and the socket. It's only uh, connected through your muscle strength and the soft tissues around the hip. So um, you can pop your hip out of the socket. It's very, very painful. Uh, I don't recommend it and I never want you to have to go through it. Um, you have to go to emergency room and have that set back into place. So I do think there are limitations of hip replacements. And all of this, I think, translates to potential limitations of function. So these days, patients want to be able to do all sorts of activities. They want to be able to run. They want to do plyometrics, things like CrossFit. They're jumping over things. Uh, they want to do yoga, high range of motion activities. So these are things that really could pose a problem for the traditional hip replacement because of the limitations that I just told you about. So uh, performing hip replacement in young active patients can be a significant challenge. The traditional total hip replacement may not allow you to go back to what you want to do, either because there are concerns about stability or concerns about longevity with the impact. So increased activity might also lead to an earlier time for revision. So you might need that hip replacement redone again because of that activity. So this is really uh, the considerations when performing hip arthroplasty or an artificial hip in younger active patients. <clears throat> this is a slide uh, from the Swedish Hip Arthroplasty Registry. Uh, it's basically a database of hip replacements done in Sweden. Uh, it's a closed medical system, so they do a really good job of kind of tracking the hip replacements and what happens to them. And what this graph is showing that is um, dislocation of a hip replacement is rising as a reason for revision. So people have a hip replacement, their hip pops out, it gets put back in, it pops out again, they end up needing it revised because they don't like it popping out. And I think this is happening more and more because we are performing this procedure in younger and younger patients. Patients are more active. And as I said, they wanna do more with their hip replacements. <clears throat> as I showed before, this was a woman who has a hip resurfacing on one side. She ended up uh, going to another surgeon, having a hip replacement because he told her hip resurfacing was not an option for her. Um, she ended up dislocating this hip because you can see that the ball of a hip replacement is smaller than that of a resurfacing. So the stability may not be as good as a hip resurfacing. <clears throat> so in order to justify resurfacing as a good procedure, you have to have, I think, compelling advantages over traditional total hip replacements. The benefits have to outweigh the risks, and that's an individual decision for each patient. So, you know, for somebody who's older or not as active, they may not choose to do a hip resurfacing, and that's a perfectly reasonable uh, decision. The major additional risk for hip resurfacing, in my opinion, is the potential reaction to metal debris, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, to also justify resurfacing, I think that a revision of a resurfacing must have an acceptable outcome. We can't make you worse if you have a hip replacement after resurfacing as compared to if you just had a hip replacement right from the get-go. <clears throat> so I do think that hip resurfacing does fulfill all of these qualities, and that's why I still believe in it. I think the key benefits, as we talked about, are preserving bone, the better joint stability, uh, the anatomy is also more like your own. So we're not cutting the bone off, inserting a rod. We're going to basically reproduce your normal anatomy in terms of leg length, your offset, antiversion. These are all biomechanical features that hip, help a hip work better. And also, a hip resurfacing loads the bone like your own bone does. So it loads, loads the bone more physiologically. All of these factors, I believe, lead to a, a greater activity level. 
in terms of the first uh, point that I made, preservation of femoral bone, uh, this is an x-ray of a hip replacement on one side, a hip resurfacing on the other. You can clearly see that the hip resurfacing does not disrupt as much of the bone as a hip replacement. So um, the nice thing about that is if you ever need surgery again, we have all your options in that proximal femur. The hip is also more stable with a resurfacing. We don't use metal on metal hip replacements anymore because they had lots of problems. They were basically recalled. So how do you achieve that stability in a patient like this who wants to be able to do splits, high range of motion activities? I think you really need the biggest ball possible. <clears throat> in terms of loading of the bone, this is a hip replacement on the left. Uh, the bright white are the titanium pieces. If you take load from the top, it goes through the stem into the bone of the femur um, and it's converted into what's called hoop stresses. It's not exactly a normal way to load the bone. It does work well um, and it, it is solid attachment, but it's not exactly the way your own bone loads, just like um, <clears throat> on the right side with a hip resurfacing, you're gonna take the load from the top. It's gonna get transmitted into the femoral neck and into this bone. And we all know that if you want to maintain your bone, you have to use that bone. So basically this was uh, <clears throat> studied uh, with something called DEXA scanning. DEXA scanning is a way to measure bone mineral density. Uh, they compared hip replacement patients versus hip resurfacing patients. And they did DEXA bone scans at uh, one year and two years. And basically the bone mineral density in certain specific areas of the bone uh, actually increased after the operation with hip resurfacing as compared to a hip replacement uh, because it's loaded. Uh, this is a picture of uh, a very typical hip that I see. It's an active male patient. This has a very long neck. Um, so that's what we call high offset. That's uh, a depiction of the offset. It's a biomechanical property that helps the muscles work better. With a hip replacement, this would be basically a plan for a hip replacement. You can see these dots are where the new hip replacement ball would be. They cannot match that offset. And this is gonna to lead to loss of offset for a resurface, excuse me, for a hip replacement. And that's why a resurfacing, I think, can be better biomechanically because it's a covering over the own bone. So basically, biomechanically, you're gonna match that length and that offset. So how does this all affect activity? Well, uh, this has been studied in multiple studies. This is uh, from Professor Haddad in London. He did a 10-year study following up hip replacements and hip resurfacings. These were all young patients under the age of 55. He had a mean follow-up of over 10 years. He partially randomized it. He tried to randomize it between hip replacement and hip resurfacing. But uh, what we often find in these studies is, is that people have a strong opinion about what treatment they want. They won't randomize it, so we can't always randomize it. Um, so basically, it's not fully randomized, but um, it's still comparative groups. And what he found is that the function scores in terms of uh, the UCLA activity score for resurfacing was higher at one, five, and 10 years. Uh, there were more patients running in the resurfacing group. So 53% were running versus about 20% with a hip replacement. And there's better functional testing if he tried to have you hop on one leg, climb steps with one leg, it was better for the resurfacing. Uh, this is another study uh, done in the United States. These are multiple surgeons. What they did is they took a telephone questionnaire. They called patients having a hip replacement, called patients having a hip resurfacing, um, over 800 patients. And they asked them basically certain questions about their activity level. And they found that um, <clears throat> there was a higher participation in sports, gym exercise, and contact sports with resurfacing, less thigh pain, and fewer restrictions or limitations in the resurfacing compared to hip replacement. Don't get me wrong, the hip replacement patients were still very active and much more active than they were before surgery, but the hip resurfacing seemed to be more active. Uh, this is a really interesting study from Justin Cobb in London. Uh, he took patients who had a resurfacing on one side, compared them to uh, their other side, which had a hip replacement. He measured their gait on an instrumented treadmill that you could 
measure how much force you push off with and how much weight you can take on that. And what he found is that he, as he increased the speed of the treadmill, um, basically the hip resurfacings started to accept more weight um, and have a longer stride. So therefore, the, the thought is that a hip resurfacing would allow you to walk faster um, and have a more normal gait because at higher speeds, uh, these differences became more apparent. Um, and we did a study at HSS, uh, myself and Alex McLawhorn. We capture all of these outcomes. If you've been a patient at HSS, you know we capture tons, tons of scores. And uh, basically, we compared hip replacement and hip resurfacing patients. We matched them for age, sex, premorbid conditions, their activity levels before they developed arthritis. And what we found is that the hip resurfacing patients uh, had a greater percentage meet a minimally clinically significant change. So basically, um, in sports and recreation, hip resurfacing patients reach that at a higher percentage than hip replacement patients. <clears throat> so all of this, I think, translates to the potential to return to activity. And hip resurfacing is the only hip arthroplasty that can claim athletes returning to professional sports, hockey, major league baseball, and NBA. So uh, these are some videos I'm going to show you. Uh, this is the hockey player. This is number 55. He's a defenseman. Uh, he's about six foot four. Uh, about a year after his resurfacing, he was able to return to uh, professional hockey, first person ever. Um, this is a basketball player, number 47 here, playing for the Sixers. And he's seven feet tall. Oh my God. And you can't even tell he had a hip operation. This was a little over a year after his resurfaced hip. I just realized I resurfaced his hip too. <laughs> <laughs> So very high level of activity. I'm not certain a hip replacement patient could do this. Uh, this is a fencer, a Russian fencer, who went to the Rio Olympics with his resurfacing. And um, I had the great fortune of uh, watching him. And he was able to win the team uh, event for the foil and win a gold medal. So uh, hip resurfacing has even won an Olympic gold medal. I had to write a letter to the International Olympic Committee and uh, tell them that hip resurfacing was not a performance enhancing device. Um, it's also conducive to running, ultra running. I never really even knew about this until some of my patients told me about this. This is when they run over a marathon length and several times, in fact. Uh, this is a race uh, of 100 miles, this patient, 64, he won his age group in the Badwater 135, so that's 135 miles in Death Valley, uh, and he won his age group with his hip resurfacing. So now he runs over 100 miles per week. Uh, he's over five years post-op. He's doing great. Uh, many of you may have heard about tennis players recently. Uh, this is Bob Bryan, professional tennis player. He's the lefty of the Byron brothers. He's also a big guy, 6'4", very athletic. Uh, this is a picture of when he got injured. So he basically came down on a serve, landed on that right leg. He's a lefty, so you land on your right side. Had significant pain, uh, had a little bit of work by the trainer, tried to uh, go back. He played a point afterwards, and then he basically had to uh, stop that match. Uh, fortunately, I uh, was able to resurface him, and uh, he was able to return. I told him that it was going to take eight months to get back onto a professional tennis court. He did it in five. He was uh, kind of a madman with his recovery, and we did learn a lot of accelerated rehab techniques. Um, and he basically competed, uh, you can see, at seven months. This is um, at Indian Wells where I watched him. 
he's in the black tights here. He's the lefty. And yes, it's doubles, but look at this kind of doubles that they play. So they're kind of known for their movement. You can see they're always bouncing around, very quick movements. So he is back on the court and uh, hopefully he's gonna have another year uh, continuing to play because of the pandemic, it's been kind of put on hold. And now we're seeing 10 year follow up. So I love seeing these patients in the office. This is a patient who was 49 at the time of his hip resurfacing. 10 years later, uh, his hip resurfacing looks exactly the same. Uh, bone is nice and strong. The implants are solidly attached. Uh, another 48 year old guy uh, who 10 years later, we're seeing great results. Uh, this is a woman that I did with something very special called the dysplasia cup. And uh, also 10 years out, she's doing absolutely fine. So uh, it's really encouraging to see these 10 year follow ups. Now we're up to some uh, 14, 15 year follow ups of resurfacings and uh, they're, they're looking terrific. So why isn't hip resurfacing more popular? Uh, not, every, not every surgeon is performing it because it does require special training. As you saw, I went all around the world to learn it. Uh, the surgical exposure, being able to preserve your bone and not have to cut it away um, makes it difficult. So um, that's not a familiar technique for most surgeons unless they learn it. And the surgery does take longer. Uh, it takes me about an hour, hour and 10 minutes, but uh, I can do a hip replacement probably 15 to 20 minutes faster. Um, so it just takes a little bit longer. And I think uh, that's a reason that some surgeons don't want to do it. Uh, we've also gotten media attention. Usually media attention is good, but uh, not in this case. This was a series of negative articles about hip resurfacing and metal and metal hip replacements. Um, a lot of these were about hip replacements and implants that were recalled. So um, it just raised a lot of concerns. If you put in metal on metal hip into Google, what you get immediately are all these uh, advertisements from lawyers about how to sue and lawsuits and things like that. So it can be very scary. And I think um, it can be understandable why surgeons are nervous about it. Uh, there are also some surgical concerns with it. Uh, you can fracture the bone. Um, basically, this is an area of bone that's somewhat delicate when people fall and they break their hip. Uh, even without surgery, that's where they break it in a hip resurfacing because you save it and that bone is going to be weaker while it's healing. Um, it can break. So basically, uh, you do have to be cautious in the beginning. We don't want you running or jumping too early. Uh, there are definitely concerns about metal ion dispersal. So the metal does go through the body. Um, for most people, those levels are very low. I do recommend we keep track of it. Usually we do our first check of that in the blood stream at one year, and then we do it every year. And once we get um, stability in those results and consistency, then we can start to space it out a little bit. But the good news is that your kidneys do a great job with uh, filtration of these metals from your system. Um, <clears throat> There could be some concerns for systemic effects, meaning throughout the body, it can potentially affect your thyroid, uh, your heart, and neurological abnormalities. So people have described this. Usually, uh, this is at a very high level in the, in the literature. It's been reported when it's over like 20 parts per billion or even closer to 80 to 100 parts per billion. The expected levels for hip resurfacing are less than seven parts per billion. So I do recommend regular monitoring so that we can ensure that these levels are in the expected range. So in addition to those three reasons that I told you about, uh, because of the metal on metal surfaces, it does lead to longer discussions with patients about metal on metal. And I think that's another reason that surgeons choose not to perform it. They would rather stick with a hip replacement where uh, they don't have to talk about these things. Um, 
in countries that have done resurfacing for a while, uh, we can get some really good information. So Australia has a registry where they again collect all their data into a database. Uh, they've been doing resurfacing since year 2000. So they have uh, over 15 year follow up. I'll just point out this is a chart for men compared to women and this is a resurfacing. So at 15 years, if you look at their data, and this is multiple surgeons and not specialty surgeons, so this is about a 9% failure rate, and that's for all reasons. If you look at men under the age of 65, and if we look at a hip replacement at 15 years, you get that same 9% at 15 years. Um, <clears throat> I think the rate can be much lower with specialty surgeons, and we'll share some of our results and from the literature as well. So um, all of this information and what's going on out there, I think, does help us select the best patients for resurfacing. It doesn't mean they're the only patients, but the ones that I can confidently tell are going to have the best results and last the longest are men under the age of 65 with osteoarthritis and not something like AVN and not hip dysplasia. And they have to have large structural bone size to support the implant. <clears throat> so that leads to the question, what about women and resurfacing? Now, uh, women can be candidates for it. Uh, Debbie is one of my greatest successes with uh, resurfacing, doing extremely well and very, very active. Um, but the smaller sizes have been withdrawn from the market for certain implants. Women have dysplasia, which means a shallower socket. Uh, and that also changes some of the angle and the contact pressures within the joint. Women are usually more flexible. So some people, some women have something called hypermobility and that leads to some laxity in the joint and that could potentially lead to a condition called edge loading. And these things could raise the risk of a problem with the metal. So um, it, it still can be done and it can be done quite successfully. But if you have these conditions, uh, you might not be a candidate and then metal ions could be an issue and that's why we do check them. Women also do tend to have different immune systems. They tend to have more autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Um, so they also have a greater chance of an allergic reaction to the metals, which are cobalt and chromium. So that's why I think as uh, you probably have heard that women are not the ideal candidates for resurfacing, uh, but they definitely still can have very successful results. Uh, this is just some new research that we're conducting for our smaller sizes. This is resurfacing in less than the 48 millimeter size. This is what's called a Kaplan-Meier curve. Uh, 1.0 means 100% have survived for the entire length of time. Here, if we look at about 12 years, um, we have about 96% uh, survivorship. So it's pretty good for these uh, women. So don't get me wrong, uh, they can still have very successful results. And if your activity level warrants it, then I think it's a great operation. So uh, finally, I'm going to close with, uh, do we need to change? You probably have heard of a lot of exciting developments with resurfacing. So can we improve upon the successes of the BHR? Um, as I said, I think the survivorship is better in surgeons who do a lot of them. So some of the reports from Derek McMinn and Ronan Tracy are 95% survivorship at 15 years. Uh, so, you know, better than a hip replacement, I would say. There are very few implants that can make that claim. So really, how can we improve upon it? Um, well, as I mentioned, I think uh, there's lots of concerns about it uh, from patients that I see. That's probably the number one question I get is about the materials. So it would be nice to have materials that don't raise those issues. Uh, so they don't have to have metal ion checks. You don't have reactions. You don't have the possibility of uh, allergic reaction. So there are uh, next generation devices that are potentially coming out. I think it is an opportunity to build upon some of the successes that we've seen, but even improve them and potentially get rid of the uh, issues that we brought up with the metal on metal surface. 
these are some experimental devices uh, that are now being used. So uh, this is a ceramic on ceramic device uh, used in the UK and Europe. This is a ceramic on ceramic device used in South Africa. Uh, this is Derek McMinns, who's using a uh, metal on polyethylene. Um, all of these things I think are, are exciting for resurfacing, but time will tell. They're still in trials. We don't have long-term data. We don't know if they're going to be better or worse than uh, what we currently have. Um, I'll just mention a, a few patients have asked me about this implant called the Synovo Preserve. Uh, this is not a new implant. Um, it is a metal on polyethylene composite. I'll just point out that the socket is very thick because uh, to accommodate for the the polyethylene, which has to be a certain thickness. Uh, this is a thick implant, so it's much thicker than uh, the metal on metal resurfacings, so it does take more bone from the acetabulum, and I think that is not really in keeping with the idea of bone preservation, so I, I don't personally use that device. I think in the future we're also going to have enabling technology, robotics, and computer navigation. Uh, they are not currently being used for resurfacing, but I think uh, that's a realm where they could make improvements, uh, especially for surgeons who find it difficult to do the operation. I think having uh, basically a GPS to tell them exactly uh, where to go, um, I think it could be very helpful for them. So that's something to look for in the future. So in conclusion, uh, hip resurfacing, I think is at a mature stage now. We're 15 to 20 years from its initiation. Uh, we have excellent results uh, in, in lots of different series. The best patients are men under the age of 65 with primary osteoarthritis as the diagnosis. You have to have good bone quality and structure. Uh, if you're a woman with those features, then you're also a, a good candidate. Um, we want you to have an activity level that would take advantage of hip resurfacing because that would make it worthwhile uh, to undergo some of those other additional risks. And I think uh, the younger you are, I think the more hip resurfacing will make sense because of the preservation of bone. So if we look at a hip replacement and compare it head to head with a resurfacing, I think it's very similar to the situation of basically a very nice luxury sedan here um, versus a Ferrari. Both are gonna drive well. Um, <clears throat> and if you just go at normal speeds, you're not gonna feel any difference between that. And that's the same with normal everyday activity. But if you want higher performance and higher activity level, then I think that Ferrari and the hip resurfacing is going to basically distinguish itself at those higher activity levels. So uh, the future does uh, look bright for resurfacing. Uh, there's opportunities to improve on the materials. There are currently trials going on. Um, I think there will be a next generation resurfacing from Smith and Nephew using oxinium, which is a, basically a ceramic uh, composite material. And I think robotics and navigation may make it easier for people and uh, more likely to adopt it in the future. Thank you so much for your attention. So...